Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the eighth Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on July 26, 2020, are 1 Kings chapter 3, 5 through 12. Our semi-continuous Old Testament reading is Genesis 29, 15 through 28. The psalm is fortunately a portion of Psalm 119, 129 through 136. The second reading is our continuation and ending of our uh, time in Romans 8, chapter 20, or verse 26 through 39, and then Matthew chapter 13, 31 through 33, and 44 through 52. I was going to say, I really appreciate uh, Holly Heron's um, commentary and um, what the connection she makes to what I will call the invincible invisible. Uh, and this, um, the, the, the small being so powerful. Um, we anticipated this a couple of weeks ago, but that mustard seed, uh, the bit of yeast, um, uh, the hidden treasure, um, uh, the, the searching, the, the um, invisible that actually is where the power lies, where the promise uh, resides. Um, I had a uh, student that did a wonderful job with um, uh, talking about this text, particularly looking at uh, the woman baking bread and calling to mind that um, Jesus, in explaining what the kingdom was like, could have taken the Roman armies or could have taken the uh, empire, uh, the power of empire. And instead, he takes the smallest, um, the least, the hidden, and the ordinary, an ordinary task of flowery hands is how Jesus uh, explains the kingdom. And how powerful is that and how unexpected? I really appreciated the commentary too, Joy, uh, and particularly that opening paragraph of how the pandemic has shown us how something so small that is invisible to the eye can grow rapidly and exponentially into a destructive force. And here we have something so small that can grow into a transformative force. Uh, and a life-changing force and a new, you know, a new existence force. And, and, and so I think that would be, that's a, a wonderful entry into this passage of, of, of what is, you know, the promise of, of God's kingdom that can, you know, that can happen, that can, that, that will grow exponentially from these really small uh, places and these small realities, growth from these insignificant beginnings. And so it's just, I, I think it's, I think the way in which a preacher puts those side by side, where we now recognize or we realize or we're experiencing the potential, in this case, destruction of this insignificance, but then how is it that the promise is out of insignificance, there's there's this exponential presence of God's kingdom. There's also been a lot of bread baking going on out there. I hear, you know, people learning how to make sourdough and all kinds of stuff. And I've never baked a loaf of bread in my life. I haven't started that. It was not on my COVID list of things to do. But uh, yeah, I think, I, think that, I think that would be a really, uh, one really uh, meaningful entry into this text. I have two year. questions. First question, what's the logic of this, this part about the treasure hidden in the field, which someone found and hid, and then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field? Is this like laundering that it, uh, if you just find something, you know, is, uh, he's trying to launder? What's going on with that? If I find a treasure, I'm just like, woohoo, I'm not going to go hide it and then buy the field. Now, I'm going to keep it and not tell anybody. I'm going to keep everything I have and the treasure. 
Yeah, exactly. And, uh, but here's, will, here's where you will know that I found a treasure. Like I will bring you like extra coffees when we get to podcast again. You. In person. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I love you, Caroline. <laughs> that is a question I have about that, but. Um, Matt, you want to answer his question? I don't. I think it's just part of the, the ridiculousness of the parable is that it's both kind of dishonest and underhanded what he's doing. And it's also kind of funny that now he's got nothing but his treasure in the, okay. in the field. Yeah. Uh, so there's something about, but I think it's, I think it's, it's meant to be the astonishment or the joy of getting this will lead you to do whatever you can do to obtain it. Like Jacob. Uh, let's come back there in a minute. Um, <laughs> but I do like the fact that both with the pearl and the treasure, it's the kingdom of heaven is worth everything you have. I mean, I think that uh, uh, even an American can get that. Um, all right, so here's the other question. So, so you've, can, you've I, got, can, I, can I break in on the pearl really quick, though? I'm, I was going to ask about that. Hold on. Oh, go ahead. So, because I want to hear about the pearl, you've got this, uh, I don't know if you'd call it a katana or whatever, you get this list of short parables. Um, do you try to preach on all of them? Do you pick one? Um, what do you do? What, was your, what would your strategy be, Matt? Spe specifically, I'm interested in the pearl. What's my strategy for you if I'm interested in, if you're interested in the pearl? Preach on the pearl. No, but like all the parables. Like oh, there's too many. Or do you? There's too many, or you do six sermons five sermons or whatever, really short ones or something. But I think you, yeah, you kind of find a theme and, and, and here are parables that I believe are not allegorical at all. I think we ruin them if we make them into allegories that these are parables about the experience of surprise, the experience of discovery, of astonishment, of recognizing that something you thought was a total pipe dream is actually within your grasp or is there for you that it's it's more like that than it is saying this is what the kingdom is worth or something like that or this is what you need to do now in response and all these parables have a way of doing that i think because they're all a little bit slippery they're all a little bit sneaky except for the dragnet that one's just kind of gross but maybe it's it's uh maybe one way to think about it is an an invitation for our listeners to to give witness to, or to remember, or to think about those places and spaces where there, that, there, there, that insignificance or those modest beginnings uh, turn into something that you could never have imagined. And I, I, I think, uh, or even like a wider perspective on this with regard to the ways in which, uh, the ways in which the church has had to reimagine what church is in the last couple of months of, of uh, uh, that, that you, you know, here's a church that's uh, not the one down the road that has all of the media equipment and, and all the special lights and everything, but they do their service for their people. And yet, and yet, uh, and yet people are watching all, all, oh, you've got to see my pastor preach or, you know, and th there's a way in which this is happening right now. Uh, there, there's a way in which the kingdom of God is 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 spreading <laughs> in ways that we just never imagined. And and if you think about the responses of of the death of George Floyd, the way in which the justice of the kingdom moved out of you know where I live, South Minneapolis, to through the the entirety of the world. And so there's a, there's a promise in that, that that's what, that's what the king, that's the nature of the kingdom, uh, that once it gets planted um, and, you, and you believe in that, then something's going to happen. And the, um, the opposite of describing the kingdom out of the powers and the empires and the structures and the systems that we have mistakenly put our trust in. You know, it, it is th th these parables and, and to answer the question, now I, I would take one recognizing that each of them do uh, very much the same thing. 
uh, as Caroline's already uh, lined out, and to use that um, um, uh, not as an allegory uh, as you described, Matt, but to point to this uh, capacity for the kingdom of God to spread uh, from such an insignificant uh, beginning to such an incredible uh, reality if we would only allow um, uh, allow that spread to take place. How's that, Ralph? It's fantastic. Appreciate it. Thank you. Should we? It all reminds me of Solomon. Oh, okay. Okay, not really. But <laughs> are you trying to make a connection? I was working on it. I'm not yeah. good at segues. I skipped that day in preaching class in seminary. Well, I here was here is the connection I made. I don't know if I made this connection three years ago, but this is the connection I made this time around. Is that you know that prayer for, uh, and I you know I think the um, the the you know the commentary uh, talks about this some too, but uh, but that this prayer for a wise and discerning mind uh, that that the you know, even, I mean, that there is still, there still needs to be that uh, to be able to, like you said, Joy, where, where do we look for the kingdom? Where, where do we look for the, the, the work of the kingdom? Are we trapped in certain system and in, in the system that sees it, you know, in certain manifestations of power uh, or certain, uh, you know, certain, um, societal constructions of of kingdom and power and such or is this does do we need a retraining of our minds and a, and a, a discernment of our minds to see it in places we wouldn't uh to see that manifestation happening in in ways and and in people and in moments and occurrences that that are unexpected and so that's the connection i made is that we that we pray for that we pray for that discernment. We pray for that mind and the, in the, in the way in which our mind has to be retrained uh, in, in the fact that, that because this is not, we have been socialized to look for powers in certain constructs. And so that we, we, we need to pray for a, a wise mind. That's my connection. What do you think? I am, um, oh, go ahead, Matt. I was gonna say that works. What I, the one thing I don't like is, and you've been using the word wisdom, which is typically how we talk about Solomon prayed for wisdom. The language here is knowledge. I, I'll leave it to Rolf to tell me the, the difference in the Hebrew, but even that doesn't work for me. But, but, what, but what does work is the way you're talking about the need to retrain our ways of perceiving, the, the need to see something differently you mentioned a couple of weeks ago what a parable is and it's just a simple you know casting one thing alongside something else and then reinterpreting so that idea of how does the church pray together for different ways of perceiving reality or different ways of constructing right and wrong and the presence of god in the world having just a really a different whole what's the word i want kind of a network of perception that we do as individuals, yeah, like Solomon did, but really that's a communal thing. That, that's part of why we come together in worship is to continue to reorient ourselves to a different way of viewing God and ourselves and, re, and the world around us. Well, the, yeah, the commentary at the end, so Rolf, I'd love to hear what you, what you think about that because the commentary talks about that uh, in that, behold, I give you a heart of wisdom and discernment uh, that to understand means the ability to tell the difference between things. And so that's, yeah, is that, yeah, is, it, it does use help the us word, out, Rolf. it does use the word wise in verse 12 um, in, in its adjectival form. Um, but what's more interesting, and of course, uh, Solomon is connected with wisdom. What's more interesting to me, or excuse me, what's equally interesting is at the, uh, what's translated in the NRSV, uh, you have asked, uh, you have asked your, for yourself understanding to, uh, and the, literally in Hebrew, it's to hear justice. And uh, the translation is to discern what is right. But I think 
in our context, especially justice is a much more powerful concept. Um, and it's to hear uh, justice. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, of course, uh, I would not try to make a connection in any way to, um, to Matthew. Uh, I would just maybe preach on this and, and to invite us all to put ourselves in Solomon's place. Um, and, I would, and I would make a connection back to Genesis 3, where um, the man and the woman um, gain the ability to understand right or wrong, but having that ability does not give us the um, um, a, knowing right from wrong is not the same as being able to choose right over wrong. That's the human condition is I, I sometimes I know right from wrong and I do wrong anyway, just because I want to. Uh, or I know what's right and I can't bring myself to do it or I'm not able to achieve it. I mean that, that uh, but all of us can be put in Solomon's place um, sort of uh, with the sort of priesthood of all believers notion is that uh, we shouldn't leave it just to the rulers. Their job is to do justice or hear justice. It's each of our jobs to do it together. Um, so that's, uh, I think, the direction I would go with First Kings. I love that. So you're talking about, you're talking about verse 11, the end of verse 11. So I've asked for under, your self-understanding <clears throat> to discern what is right. And that's to hear justice. Yep. I love that. I do too. I won the podcast. You did. You do. You do. And um, a small detail that becomes significant for us in this particular historical moment, and that is that he was a child. That he was that he was young when this prayer is is offered, and what what does it mean for us to realize that some of the failures that we have made in the past, just as some of the failures that he would have seen in his father David, are now an opportunity for the next generation to say, "I want the wisdom of God, so that I can see and do justice." Wow. Yeah, and I, I, I want thank you. Uh, I want to point out that it's really painful to hear justice. I mean, to hear people's stories of victimization, um, it's really uncomfortable. And I don't want to do it. You know, um, m most Americans just want to hear. Most, in fact, everybody would rather um, uh, uh, skip over the really horrible parts of their history. And you can, and, and there's examples this, of this in every culture. Um, of leaving out the painful stories. Absolutely, and, and this is a place where the text can do the heavy lifting because we wanna leave out the difficult stories from, from David's life, from Solomon's life, from Solomon's identity. Um, and, and so we can stay and let the text do the heavy lifting for this. The parallels are painful uh, for us to hear. I love that, Ralph. Well, let's, uh, let's go to Jacob, uh, Matt's favorite character in Genesis. And uh, the story of Laban and Rachel and Leah and Jacob. I like this story. <laughs> Talk about it. Oh, it's just a horrible story in the sense of, well, I feel you, for Leah. Wait, you do story. like the story or you don't? I do not like this oh. chapter in Jacob's life. I'm not so I, sure Jacob does like, much that's and wrong. I was like, what? Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. This is, I would skip this story and, and read Romans 8 twice instead. How about that? This is, yeah, you know, it's, and, and Esther, <laughs> Esther Men um, in the commentary basically, you know, uh, does her best in the sense of just describing all of the ways in which the story is utterly foreign, and utterly horrible. And I'm like, well, she's got to be done now, right? And there's one more paragraph. And on this detail, I'm like, well, she must be done now. Well, there's much detail as well. Uh, you know, it's, it perhaps is a place to drop in and, and, and give Rachel and Leah their time in the pulpit because we're not going to get other aspects of their story. And that's horrible. And in a number of ways, it's, I, I can imagine a, a, a very topical sermon that, that takes its point of departure from there. But don't make this, a, don't make this, that was the last thing I'll say, don't make this passage an opportunity for a lighthearted sermon about Laban and Jacob having their pissing match back and forth. Can I say that in the podcast? Yes. 
because there are there are other people in this story who don't have a voice and whose futures are full of pain as well. So, but everybody, you, well, you know that I'm preaching to the podcast choir here. I just want to comment on one little detail of the story um, that uh, the NRSV has in verse 17, Leah, uh, uh, Leah's eyes were lovely. And a, tr a traditional translation is Leah had weak eyes. Uh, and uh, um, we, the word is squirrely. We don't exactly know what that Hebrew word means, but uh, I think for, uh, for lots of reasons, some ideological, some lexical, lexical uh, Leah had lovely eyes is the preferred translation. Yeah, you know, we've talked uh, over the years and even I think more so lately than I remember our, pod, our beginning days of podcasting, that there are some passages in scripture that I think simply cannot be read out loud unless you're going to preach on them. Uh, or they can't be read out loud in in the in the congregation in the community. Mark ten being one uh, about divorce, but number of passages that I think you just you can't read them out loud and and then you know move on to Romans. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is one of them. Like I and I don't remember having such a visceral reaction three years ago to this, but this time around I really did. And it and for everything that Esther Men talked about, uh, every single paragraph, I'm like, yep, 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 yep. I mean, this this passage is a trigger passage. This passage is a uh, uh, could uh, elicit trauma, uh, uh, PTSD. I think it's on so many levels, and so that's all I want to say. <laughs> I don't, you know, if you're going to preach it, then, then you really have to tackle a lot of stuff. And I think I, and, and I, I would encourage a, a preacher to do that, but you cannot. And I, I agree with you, Matt, I, you focus on Rachel and Leah and, but just the, the, the complexities of the way in which so much of socialize, socialize, socialization of women uh, to which this passage has contributed, uh, the competition between women, uh, and and then issues with regard to infertility and and ownership and marriage. It's just, I, I yeah, I couldn't not say that. So I don't know what I would do with it, but I, it's just yeah, you can't just you. I, that's the, that's reaction I had, and I almost like, I almost like threw my paper down. <laughs> Because it was so upsetting. And it becomes even more so after folks have been quarantined, living at home, maybe in the midst of this reality. And and mm -hmm. so I just want to weigh in in agreement with what's been said. Uh, I really appreciate it, uh, the commentary. And to acknowledge that if you, like you said, Caroline, if you're going to read this, then you have got to tackle those issues because they will be as much to the surface uh, from the uh, private individual lives as the public protests that we've been, uh, you know, pointing to. All right, Psalm. Anything about the Psalm? Good thing we just have a portion of it. Yeah, Psalm. Uh, uh, psalm. Because uh, Psalm 119 is the longest Psalm. Yeah, I, I didn't even ever. I didn't even. Uh, look up the Hebrew to find out which out letter of the alphabet this is um, in the Hebrew. Um, it might be, uh, I, I could find out in it, uh, but I'm not going to because it's easy to find out. Um, yeah, so it's a part and uh, I, I refer everybody to uh, uh, detox um, commentary on the website. Let's go to Romans. Well, this is a lot easier to preach than the other passages we've talked about, right? This is, there are all sorts of handholds to grab onto here and, and, and take, and it speaks probably in any kind of context, but it speaks especially in so much of the global context right now, whether you're talking about justice, whether you're talking about uh, the, the, the social effects of, of COVID-19. Of course, those are two related things that we're talking about as well. 
so much there that's worth talking about. We've talked a lot about, maybe I've talked a lot about powers over the course of our study in Romans, and this is, this is who Paul's addressing here in verses uh, 35 and following. He's addressing these things that have real power to do harm that are uh, not visible necessarily, that aren't always easily identifiable or placed in a single person. And Paul is, well, Beverly Gaventa in her book, When in Romans, says this is trash talk, that Paul is just here trash talking the powers of the universe <laughs> and just saying, you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You can have some fun with that. Well, and it's one of those uh, it's one of those passages too, where there's familiarity uh, that there are a lot of a lot of these verses uh, that you know the the promise of the Spirit's intercession uh, when 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 we're not able to find the words uh, the uh, you know particularly the last uh, those last two verses of that nothing can separate us from the love of God and in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And, um, and I think that that's, uh, I think those words are going to be heard very differently this year uh, with the kind of um, the realities of death and destruction that, that we've, that we've lived in. And uh, that, and so, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's a, it's a beautiful passage and it's, it's one where, you know, it's, it's like, it, it's, it's one of those uh, opportunities, those homiletical opportunities where you get verses like this that are usually on plaques or on a bookmark or something, and you get to put it back into its context and say, how do we, how do we hear it now in this context, but also in the context of Paul and the promises of, of Romans that uh, would be worth a sermon. <laughs>